On today's World Insight, we continue our discussion with Chinese CDC Director Gao Fu. He describes the two-fronted battle against the coronavirus and the infodemic. But then, we also realize it's also very efficient. Home to home transfer, not just there is home to home transfer. And we speak to British scholar Martin Jean. He explores the role of governance in halting the pandemic. That's the dilemma the world is faced with someone like Trump being the president of the United States. And finally, there is nothing like the universal language of music to bring together people from around the world. One renowned Chinese pianist is doing his part in this effort. I think that the human being we need music, we need great, you know, kind of uh, emotion being together. Here is our host, Tian Wei. Hello and welcome to World Insight. Coming to you from Beijing, I'm Tian Wei. We start with the COVID-19 outbreak in China, measured by the number of cases. The darkest phase of the pandemic in China has passed. However, there have been lingering issues that warrant further discussion. To tackle these issues, we invited Dr. Gao Fu, the director of the Chinese CDC, also a member of the high-level expert group of the National Health Commission. The group consists of some of the top epidemiologists and virologists coming from China. They have been working to curb the COVID-19 spreading in this country. He answered some of the most important questions about the early stage of the outbreak. When did you travel to the city of Wuhan? On the 17th, uh, the commission decided to have a um, senior advisory group to go there again. Mm -hmm. I'm one of them. We have six members, including Dr. Zheng Nanshan, Yuan Guoyong, uh, Li Lanjue, Zheng Guang, Du Bing. So we went there and we, um, we, we, I think we got together in the evening of 18th. Mm -hmm. So we went to the hospitals and we talked to the doctors and uh, you know all this um, on, the 19th. On, on the 19th morning. And um, in the afternoon, we have a group meeting. Of course, we, we already got the conclusion. It's clear. On the 19th, during the afternoon meeting, was there suspicion of human-to-human -human transmission being collectively expressed by the expert group, which you are part of it, to the authority? And later, of course, we know Mr. Zhong Nanshan during even a CCTV interview uh, talked about that possibility. Uh, yes, and uh, we, you know, we discussed that in the meeting in the afternoon. You know, already as Dr. Yue Guoyong all mentioned about this, and also Dr. Li Lanjue mm -hmm. mentioned about this. Yeah, of course, we discussed this uh, human to human transmission, but then we also realized it's, it's already very efficient human to human transmission, not just that there is oh, human to human transmission. You look at so now you look at, uh, we, we know that's home, 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 home. the only problem is the seriousness, how serious. So for that special, special senior advisory group, when there, we see the whole series. So once so you, we go there, we were talking to a, a lot of people, we already have some suspected clusters, but by then um, it's, we have some clear cluster cases already there. So I think, you know, for that, um, there's no doubt. So when we, had the, when we were interviewed, we had this uh, press conference uh, in the evening, 19th. I said, you know, and of course Dr. Jun, everybody said, about five hours there, uh, I, I, you know, I said in a uh, press conference, you know, this virus, of course, because of the origin of virus, every people, everybody thought it's from the animal. So it's already finished its job. I call the job, quote, from, we call it animal to human and then limited human to human transmission. Mm -hmm. And then human to human, human. By then I said, you know, already they finished the, by 20th, we claim the virus finished those three steps. It's already efficient human to human transmission. As scientist, Dr. Gao, contributing to international science journals about the latest discoveries to your peers around the world, that's almost a responsibility of any scientist to update everybody to be on the same level. However, there have been debates about what should be the priorities in terms of a outbreak of disease. 
I understand you and some of your counterparts from different parts of China have been writing two important articles and published in the New England Journal of Medicine. One is about the virus itself, the other is more about how it transmitted and what are the realities. Dr. Gao, what do you make of people's debate about this? We are doing our job like Tom and Jerry. You know, if Jerry has a virus, Tom has us. Yes. That's a Tom and Jerry story here. So we are playing, I think, virus and the human beings. You know, while we are fighting, meanwhile, we are playing. You have two parts. So that's why you mentioned the two, two papers. Uh, New England Journal of Medicine. One is about Jerry, the other is about Tom. So who was infected and how they were infected. So those information are very important to be shared worldwide. The only thing, how would you share your information? For more than three to four centuries, the scientists, the public, the whole people in the world realize publication in a peer-reviewed journal is the best way. That's still the best way because whatever you are seeing, it must be judged first. By your peers. By your peers. Exactly. And your small field peers. You know, you all know some of them, you know. That's why they have peer review, actually. Exactly. All the scientists should realize this if you have any idea. If you, you know, and again, this is for the science. You have hypothesis driven science. You know, knock your head, say, not yet. Oh, well, I have an idea. You know, this is a great idea. Can my students work together? We have a solution for a cancer world that's hypothesis driven. And also, you have descriptive science, like the investigation. The two for us, that's descriptive. We don't have any hypothesis. Here's a disease. Okay, go to investigate. We did the investigation. Here's the result. Describe whatever you found. Those two papers is descriptive science. It's really not some scientific breakthrough. Most important is a hypothesis driven is a breakthrough, but this kind of is a breakthrough, but descriptive science. Got it. So this is why we need to get published in a peer-reviewed journal. One is peer-reviewed, and then it will be the public, of course, like we discussed earlier. You got to remember how would you, you know, explain your data. I mean, for you this time, there are some really, you know, discussing about you know, why we have this paper published, blah, blah, blah. So a lot of stuff. But you didn't argue back. First, you know, I will focus on my job. And second, I do think this kind of science, because all this is a social media discussion. I do think you need to explain. I think this would be very difficult to explain to the social media. All the scientists, they should know. The only thing, you know, some scientists, they didn't understand well what it was. And then they have a misunderstanding or mis-explanation uh, there. So Dr. Gao, we've been hearing epidemic from day one, from since the outbreak. Many suggest there's another thing that's going on right here, going parallel with it, mm -hmm. which is called an infodemic. Mm -hmm. A good uh, word. Which means people are more fascinated by uh, misinformation, imagination, and hypothesis. To a scientist like Hugh, what do you make of this? I would encourage um, uh, the public or the, any expert to go and read um, our February 12th issue of MIT Technology Review. Mm -hmm. There, the very good word. They use, what is a euphodemic? Euphodemic means euphemism, euph, and the misinformation, demic, zipped together. You know, take the, the special, yeah, the, yeah, really word, the zip. They zip together, that means in a huge amount of the information and the missing information, they put them together. So sometimes, you know, it's very difficult to, to make the judgment for the public. So this is why, you know, so many people are talking about this. So this could be a very serious problem because of social media here now. So um, uh, and during the February, uh, for us, um, we are not only working for the epidemic, of course now it's pandemic, but also we are working on Euphodemic. So this is why you, you said why I didn't, you know, speak out. If I do that, that would have provoked even, in my opinion, worse information, worse discussion. So this is why I called everybody, everybody, the journalists, everybody who want to talk to me said, okay, go and work together. Get the virus out, get the disease down. This is our priority. 
you know, you look at this non-science-based discussion, it has no science base at all. And how can you argue with, because I see, you know, it's, it, you are not in the same channels, and how can you discuss this? It will be very, very hard, very, very uh, difficult. People already in panic, just call people to get the virus done. That's what you scientists are likely to face in the future. I mean, every time probably there's issues like this. So what are the strategies you're going to have to deal with this situation? You have to remember, I didn't see anything about myself. I did see something. I did address a lot of stuff about the work, what we should do, and uh, what I'm doing. Yeah. Every personnel, like me, you are that kind of fur. And the whole city or the country or the whole city is a scheme. The fur must be put into the scheme. So for the fur, it doesn't matter. But most important thing at that time, though we have a discussion, the most important thing is the skin is the fighting against the virus. For any individual, it's not that important. I made a lot of comments about what we should do, what we should learn from the war, but I never said about myself. I did say something. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, that's totally different. China's effort in curbing COVID-19 is facing new challenges. Imported cases are flaring up while domestic transmissions have been controlled. There is concern along China's border with Russia now, where the town of Suifenhe has seen a recent string of locally transmitted coronavirus cases. And even in the capital city of Beijing, there have been reports of a case who tested positive after completing two-week quarantine and virus testing. Last week, China also updated the mortality rate in the city of Wuhan, where the pandemic started. For questions related to all these issues, Dr. Gao Fu gave his opinions. Now, we are already in a very different stage of this pandemic, for China particularly. The first stage seemed to be prevention control, even mitigation, quite successful. But what is China's exit strategy? Um, I mean, if we had uh, SARS or SARS-like, now we can claim we already won the war. The problem is this is not a SARS. It is also not a HXOY even flu. Mm. It's a real pandemic one with faster, it's much faster than any other virus transmission, and which much higher a infection rate, you know, the R0 is very, very high. Uh, a lot of hated characters of this virus. And um, more importantly, it's already a pandemic. Mm -hmm. To end this war, to exit from this um, pandemic, we might need to use different strategies now. Right. You know, we won the war mm -hmm. in Wuhan and Hubei. But now, you know, we have some exported imported cases in some area, especially in Heilongjiang. Right. You know, a lot of uh, uh, cases and uh, they traveled back from Russia. So now we are, you know, we have the, the different problems. So we tend to see, uh, we are adjusting our strategy. Talking about that, Dr. Gao, if I could, uh, Hubei, Wuhan, is a very specific case. That's one city, one province, helped and supported by the whole nation efforts. But in Northeast China now, uh, Sui Feng He, mm -hmm. it's a very dangerous sign that there might be sporadic cases in different parts of China that could evolve eventually into community uh, spreading and even further than that, mm -hmm. which means all the healthcare resources will be hugely challenged, particularly at the local level. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean to you? How much of alarm is it raining to you, sir? I think the alarm is already very, very loud. So this is why China CDC already sent a team. I heard about with that. A, with a capacity for 1,000 cases a day for this you know, diagnostic uh, mobile. Mm -hmm. P3 lab. But this is exhausting. I mean, one battle after another, you already see the fatigue going on in the society. What does that mean to you? One after another, even though the society already feel exhausted. It's a really unusual virus. Um, 
at the moment, everybody realizes it's not because of China, because the world, the rest of the world. We have so many cases now is imported, you know, except for Wuhan and Hubei. For one month, the whole country, there's no cases at all. But now the case back, like you said, we are, you know, really alarming there. It could be a problem, but we learn a lesson from what happened in Wuhan. Yeah. We learn experience, what we have done in Wuhan. I think by the end, we, the human being, we will be in the business. I I'm confident. Another thing, Dr. Gao, is about the numbers. You've been dealing with your international counterparts on such a frequent basis. What about the numbers? I think um, there are some rumors, there are some sayings around the world claiming China might, uh, you know, uh, hide some numbers. No. The answer is no. Well, of course, you're a China CDC head. You say, oh, no, China is not hiding the number. Let me see. Because this is a virus. This is an infectious disease. You cannot hide a virus. You know, if you hide the number, or a good example, you cannot reopen Wuhan. If you reopen Wuhan, the Wuhan will have new cases. That's for sure. So when we see no more cases in Wuhan, it's no more cases. If we go back to Wuhan, of course, people are also talking about asymptomatic infection. So if it's asymptomatic infection, so you know, that's not the disease case. It's just a kind of infection. So of course, from the very beginning, maybe we didn't realize that asymptomatic it was so serious. Now we are back. Right. We are doing investigation by screening of serology to test or who might be infected during the first wave of infection. We are doing that. Mm. I think there's no deliberate uh, hidden numbers uh, here at all. So the only thing maybe we have some asymptomatic effects there. Uh, and more importantly, you look at uh, when you are talking about the hidden numbers or whatsoever, um, you know, when we have this serious problem in Wuhan and Hubei, you look at, you look at uh, what happened in other areas. You are living in Beijing. You know, would you think in your neighborhood there are some cases were hidden? You never see your colleagues or your neighbor, they were you know, disappeared. Yeah. They are there. So I think, you know, it's so, I mean, you cannot hide any infectious disease so, cases. So what is the scale of testing that we have already? I think uh, previously we only uh, did the test for the virus itself. That means the uh, virus genome, the PCR-based test. Yeah. So for all those suspected cases and uh, also for the close contact. And now, of course, we are doing the same thing. I mean, if you missed any uh, cases, any suspected, any close contacts, I mean, we are in the trouble. Again, I want to, I'm telling you, we are facing infectious diseases. It's not a cancer patient. If a cancer patient, you can hide, you can, you know, mislabel, you can do all this kind of, you know, job. But for infectious diseases, the virus itself will tell you the truth. The fact is the fact. Whatever you saw now in China is the fact. So, Dr. Gao, what's next from now on? You know, it looks like now we are facing the pandemic. Um, the virus is in more than uh, 200 countries. Um, I would quote Dr. Tezu's word, say, solidarity, solidarity, and solidarity. We need to unite together, everybody in the world. Mm -hmm. So let's work together. That's the next. And uh, so make sure everybody understands what we are doing Everybody is involved in this activity. My exclusive interview with Dr. Gao Fu, the director of China CDC. You're watching World Insights still to come on our program today. We speak uh, uh, to South British Korea, scholar Martin Jack. He discusses the role uh, of governance uh, in halting the pandemic. Welcome back. You're still watching World Inside. I'm Tian Wei. We continue our discussion on COVID-19. The number of confirmed cases has now passed almost the 2.5 million globally. 
over 170,000 people also died. Yet the WHO has warned that the worst is yet to come. Lately, we have talked to Martin Jacques, a senior fellow at the Department of Political Science and International Studies from Cambridge University. He's also author of the book, When China Rules the World. He gave his opinions on the performance of governments and governance around the world in coping with the challenges of COVID-19. Tell me more about your reaction to the U.S. decision to halt WHO funding. Well, I mean, unfortunately, it's not surprising because we know that Trump is capable not only of the unexpected, but in also, also in a sense, the predictable, because uh, his view of the world uh, is America first. And uh, so uh, he's not really bothered about other nations and what other nations uh, uh, need. He's just bothered, basically, at the end of the day, this is a decision based on his desire to win the next presidential election uh, in America. So it's a complete abdication of any kind of responsibility to the world. So uh, are we going to be, in a way, delayed as a result of the action from the U.S.? What does it depend on? The only way we're going to be able to deal with this successfully is by global cooperation, uh, not one nation on its own, but nations uh, together, because uh, we, we're not out of the woods yet in relationship to this. It could, uh, outbreaks could, uh, could go on, further outbreaks, second, third. You know, we don't know how uh, the, the virus might mutate over time. So it's absolutely vital uh, that we have uh, uh, collaboration. Now, the danger is that with, if America suspends its funding, it's a, a very significant funder of the WHO, then how is that going to be made good? But in a wider way, probably, uh, and there's optimistic noises coming from the WHO about how they're going to handle this uh, action by the Americans, but generally it creates an, an area of confusion, of conflict, of distraction, which prevents the world concentrating on what it needs to do. You know, there are two things that need to be done. One, countries need to concentrate on handling the outbreaks in their own territory, and secondly, cooperating and learning from each other. Mm -hmm. As clear as that, these are the priorities. These should be the most important tasks. How confident are you the next step? Well, I'm not so confident. I mean, I, I, I think we just have to be relatively pragmatic while also being thinking strategically about the future. But Pragmatically speaking, you know, countries are wrestling with uh, the spread. So, uh, I mean, it looks possibly as if Europe uh, is just uh, beginning to turn the corner. But don't let's get too optimistic about that. I mean, the, the worst cases have been Italy and Spain, uh, and uh, they seem to uh, maybe uh, peaked. Um, the UK situation is very serious, and of course the American situation, where, which is the worst in terms of the number of deaths, uh, is, uh, well, it, you know, the, the trouble in the American situation is not least. The polarization of American politics means uh, there's not been a proper concerted action. Uh, I mean, New, New York's been handled well uh, by Cuomo, relatively well, I think. Um, but, you know, Trump's always pulling in another direction, speaking to a different audience, the audience he thinks is going to elect him at the next uh, in the presidential election in, in November. So I think that uh, which and the other thing that must be added here, uh, and I think this could be absolutely critical next question, which is what is going to happen to the developing countries? What's going to happen in uh, in your in, uh, you know, in East Asia, in, for example, in Indonesia, uh, in the Philippines? Uh, what's going to happen in uh, sub-Saharan Africa? Um, we are th these countries have got very weak uh, health facilities, uh, uh, very low proportion of doctors uh, per, uh, in, in the population. So th that that could be a big problem because then you get you know then you can have easily a feedback a kickback effect from the developing countries back into the relatively rich countries. So. We, we, we don't know the end of it. The story is not finished. And we're seeing many of those cracks right now. The question really is, uh, Mr. Jacques, 
Are our lives going to be sacrificed as a result of the U.S. presidential election? All of our lives? Well, uh, I think that Trump is really only interested in one thing, and that is his re-election. It shows you, you know, uh, Trump shows you how dangerous it is if you get a, the, the leader of the United States simply playing to a, a section of the American population which, with which uh, he has some kind of uh, affinity, some kind of resonance, and their interests and their prejudices are placed above those of the rest of the United States, which is at least half the United States, and the rest of the world. And that's the situation. That's the dilemma the world is faced with someone like Trump being the president of the United States. We have noticed that you've been observing very closely since the very beginning of the pandemic. I mean, COVID-19 being pronounced by the WHO as a pandemic. Uh, the governance style, quote unquote, of the East and the West. Tell me more about your uh, observation results. Well, I think there's there have been very marked differences, actually. Um, I mean, if you take East Asia, uh, by which I mean uh, China, uh, Vietnam, uh, uh, South Korea, Singapore, and so on, um, uh, they, they've all handled uh, the uh, virus pretty successfully, relatively speaking. I mean, you know, this is a completely new phenomenon. China always is confronted with a, an unknown. It couldn't look elsewhere. It had to understand it itself and so on. And I think basically uh, they've acted uh, with uh, uh, very well in these countries, uh, once they realized just what a great danger it was, uh, with great effect. Uh, why? Uh, well, I think that's got culturally, uh, it's not just a political question, it's a cultural question as well. That's to do with this strong relationship uh, in Confucian style societies between the state and the individual. You know, the state and the individuals expect governments uh, in these countries to give a lead. They expect governments uh, to take the initiative, uh, and they will respond, and people will respond in a in a, in a, in, a, in a very uh, orderly and uh, um, and a solidaristic way. Now, in the in in Europe and the United States, I think it's much less like that. It varies across uh, the, the different countries. They're not all the same, um, but. The, the tendency there has, I mean, this kind of uh, relationship between state and individual is much, it's much more distant. And therefore, this, it's not just that individuals don't react in the same way, it's that the state is disinclined to intervene in this way. So, it, you know, if, you look, if I look at my own country, really the idea of the lockdown was, you know, it was very, very slowly adopted uh, by the government. It was reluctant, it moved, uh, uh, a really relative to the, the urgency of the time, in a snail-like way, a snail's pace, uh, to react to the situation. So I, I think that uh, certainly to deal with an epidemic of this kind, you know, by and large, I would say uh, countries like China, uh, Vietnam, uh, the ones I listed earlier, uh, have been able to deal with it much more effectively. And you can see that in the, the death, I mean, the, the figures for the numbers that have died. Uh, show that difference. Of course, the other extreme on the Western side is the United States, um, where the attitude towards government in the United States is, uh, in the popular uh, view, is to keep it at arm's length, to keep it at bay. You know, the state is a problem. The state is an, even an adversary, an enemy. So therefore, to get effective action is much more difficult. And that is complicated by two other factors and that in the United States. One is the federal system. So there's the states on the one hand and the national government on the other. And the other problem is the deep polarization now in American politics, which really in some degree or, or another paralyzes uh, or, or greatly undermines the capacity to do things. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Jack, uh, one of the things we're talking about is we have to understand pandemic. Pandemic is something that you have to react quickly and otherwise it could grow with exponential speed. Uh, whether you're talking about cultural factor or governance styles, are these questions relevant 
in face of life and death? Actually, my guess is that the spread, we have, we're still at the early stages of this, by the way, um, because, you know, most people live in the developing world. Um, and so uh, and it, it's reached the developing world uh, later, uh, you know, China and then East Asia and then Europe and then the United States, North America and so on. But it hasn't, you know, it's only now really. Uh, uh, taking hold in India uh, and in uh, sub-Saharan Africa and so on. And I think that, uh, you know, those figures that we've got at the moment are, I fear to say this, but I think maybe are only the first phase or first and second phase of what we're going to see. It's going to become, I think, very, very serious. How do you see the responsibilities government has played so far during this stage of COVID-19? I'm not saying the next stage, but this stage so far. Are they disappointing? Are they, should we be optimistic? Uh, uh, what can we expect? Can we expect them to change for the better? Uh, your assessment? Well, I think the word you use, disappointing, is the most accurate one. China, uh, took drastic action and was, I think, brilliant uh, in that phase from uh, from about around about the 23rd of January, the, the, the lockdown in, uh, in Wuhan and so on. But you've got to look at what the reaction in the West was. The reaction in the West during the course of January was basically to say about China, you know, you're covering up. Uh, it's all about secrecy. You're not being honest. You're not telling us, you know, you're not being honest with your own people. Uh, the government's only interested in its own survival. It's not interested in, you know, Chinese lives and so on. All this kind of thing. It really, it was aggressive. The response was very aggressive. It was a real anti-China assault in the course of January. I don't, we mustn't forget that or, 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 or misunderstand that. It was like that. And the result of this, I think, essentially, was that people, uh, uh, the, the, government, government, the governing classes in the West didn't think this could reach them, that it could affect them. They thought it was a Chinese problem. And they therefore totally misunderstood the significance of uh, coronavirus and thought that it was, it was confined to a Chinese problem. They learned nothing. They had two months to, to prepare. They didn't prepare. The one great exception in the West, in my view, is Germany. Germany has done, it seems to me, an excellent job. It really thought about it. And it clearly learned from East Asia. It had watched East Asia. It had got uh, testing, uh, the, the necessary testing things together. And, and they've done a wonderful, relatively speaking, with, compared to the rest of the West, a wonderful job of testing and so on. But what this tells me is that, you know, the difficulty, the, the whole response to the pandemic has been colored by uh, the political uh, differences uh, to, or attitudes towards China uh, in the West, which have, which have seriously uh, uh, weakened the Western response. They didn't learn because they thought they would never be affected. If this was hubris, this was arrogance, you know, on the Western part. And we in the West countries are paying a big price for this. Now, what we need in this situation is, you know, global cooperation. Now, I, I would I'd like to make one exemption to this. And that is, the, you don't hear the scientists in the UK, for example, criticizing China. You hear them saying, well, you know, that they're, they're, they're abreast of um, a lot of the Chinese medical literature on, uh, on uh, COVID-19. Uh, they quote it. Uh, they seek to learn from this evidence. This is the kind of relationship. This sets an example, it seems to me, of what the relationship but it should be between countries and between medias and between national governments. Our exclusive interview with Martin Jacques. 
You're watching World Insights, still to come on the program. There is nothing like the universal language of music to bring people together from around the world. One renowned Chinese pianist, Lang Lang, is doing his part in this global effort. That interview The world is changing fast, taking all our lives with it. But we can change it too by seeking answers to problems through discussions and debates. On World Insight, I ask direct questions to real people in the know, seek genuine answers, but respect diverse perspectives. Our live global debates tackle the most critical issues head on. World Insight with Tian Wei. Go beyond the headlines. Welcome back. This is World Insight. I'm Tian Wei. As the coronavirus spreads, artists from around the world came together for a globally televised special in support of efforts to contain the pandemic. An all-star music extravaganza went live on most of the world's major streaming services last Saturday. The event seemed the one world together at home was organized by the World Health Organization and International Advocacy Group global citizen to support healthcare workers fighting the virus around the world. The concert had a slew of big names performers, including Lady Gaga, Andrea Bocelli, and Lang Lang. Earlier, I spoke with Chinese pianist Lang Lang exclusively. The world-renowned artist tells me about his quarantine days and why he's determined to support this global campaign, One World, Together at Home. I mean, this concert is so important. I think this, this concert is a, it's a real something that I think people need at this time. Right. You know, it's really, really, I mean, I think as a human being, we need music, they need great, you know, kind of uh, emotion being together. Uh, and uh, this is a, a concert that I think people are waiting for. What is the one that you are chosen? I'm actually playing a song called uh, Prayer. Um, and uh, I'm actually playing with uh, some of my absolute favorite musicians, like uh, Bacelli, Lady Gaga, uh, John Legend, and uh, Celine Dion. Mm. And I must say, uh, they did an amazing arrangement for, for this song. The piano almost uh, kind of like a, a orchestra. Uh -huh. uh, our uh, beautiful melodies to share to each other. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's almost like a chamber music feel. And it's really good that, uh, you know, this is a really, the song is kind of like, a, you know, staying at home, mm. sharing our love. This has been regarding as the live aid for COVID-19 in a way. We all remember that historical concert taking place decades ago, but this time for our generation, this is unique. Of course, we're excited about it, but this is also a time that's sad because the pandemic is taking away lives. For artists like you, uh, how would you balance among all of these very different emotions? I know that uh, in 1985, uh, that was a very, very, uh, most incredible uh, concert. It's almost the same idea as uh, 35 years ago, mm. but uh, the kind of the display is a quite different one challenging but at the same time exhilarating isn't it i wonder when you are playing your piece at home your parents or your wife uh, are they your first hand audience my wife was the the camera lady oh. so yeah so so because that time i was actually on quarantine at home right and my mom also helped a little bit of you know lighting uh something you know she gave me some water 
<laughs> to bring. Uh, so it was a real family production <laughs> in a way that. Uh, it's a teamwork and certainly a product of family yeah. reunion, right? During quarantine days. Yes, yes. <laughs> Quite challenging days, not being able to walk around. What's your feeling about quarantine? Yeah, stay inside. And, and this is something I, I think uh, it was a little bit hard because I sometimes like to go out to get some fresh air. And, and that was a, maybe that was kind of not so easy to do. But other than that, I mean, there are a lot of things we can do at home, actually. We can mm -hmm. practice. I practice a lot. And uh, I learned many new, new repertoires. Uh, and of course, having family dinners and lunches with uh, my wife and with my mom. Uh -huh. Also, I would say we made a lot of videos to encouraging people, you know, with uh, piano music, with right. uh, some uh, of uh, you know personal speech, you know, to cheer people up. Exactly. Uh, yeah. So I think we can still do a lot of things. You are now not only teaching kids about music, as you mentioned earlier in your videos, but rather you started a foundation. It's the Lang Lang International Music Foundation. You also try to do this music project around the world, providing kids with pianos to play with and also to provide them with real music education. How does that work? And how is that you know, part of you related to everything now you are doing right now, including with this uh, concert? First of all, um, I believe music is so powerful, as we talked about before. And so um, after being a UNICEF ambassador in 2004, um, I founded uh, my uh, foundation, the Lang Lang Music Foundation, uh, uh, in 2008. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, our aim is to nurturing the next generation of uh, wonderful musicians around the globe. Mm -hmm and uh, also to build up a new music program in the public schools. Because very often uh, around the globe, the public schools doesn't have a music class mm -hmm. uh, due to budgeting problem or other problems. So what we uh, did first is to creating the, the programs, uh, which also uh, involve with uh, you know, technology because uh, we can now work with the 30 kid uh, mm -hmm. in a music class right. in the same time uh, okay. with uh, one teacher. Music, uh, for me, if you don't really play yourself, mm. it will be very hard. It's like learning a language. If a language you only learn but never use it, never communicate with it, then you will never improve. Yeah. And so I think the communication is the key uh, with music as well. It was exactly the same as uh, in the socializing or like communication, mm. building a bridge. Earlier, my exclusive interview with Chinese pianist Lang Lang. And that will do it for this edition of World Insight. To find out more, you can always search us, World Insight, or check out our YouTube channel. Follow us on Twitter and Facebook accounts. From Mi Tianwei and everyone on the team, thanks for watching.